This is, a, this is what we started a couple years ago. Uh, the, the end of the program, sort of a general topic, get some senior people from the industry and different aspects of the business, and then just talk about whatever anybody wants to talk about. Anything that was discussed in other panels, fine. New topics, fine. And I'll, I'll start to start it off, but I'm really looking for a lot of questions from the audience, all right? So what we have, uh, we have at that end, Tim Hess, who's the manager of a natural gas vehicle business uh, at Black Hills Corporation. We have Jack Chimente, president of Lincoln Composites. Uh, I, I, I'm looking to see which order. Uh, Tom Sewell is president of Tulsa Gas Technology and um, Technologies. And uh, Mark Smith, uh, you know, from the U.S. Uh, DOE Clean Cities Program. Of all things we talked about uh, over the last day, and actually the last couple of days, what's the most important topic that you heard or discussed, uh, whether vehicles or infrastructure? You know, what's the most important? Topic? And, and if you can't think about important, what's the most uh, important to you personally? Uh, of, of anything we discussed. Start with Tim. All right. Uh, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, he turned I, I, his on. I believe the most important thing is, uh, is really getting the word out, continuing to get the word out about natural gas vehicles, the benefits that it brings, and making sure those, those fleet operators out there are aware of those benefits. Well, I think we've gotten the word out pretty well. I mean, our, our challenge is really trying to decide whether we're going at a rate like this or a rate like this. As a manufacturer, that affects us as to how to right size our facility. We've been increasing. We, two years ago, we put in a new facility. Today, we're forced with looking at additional assets to be able to meet the demand. But knowing what that demand is is, is obviously a challenge. Right sizing. Uh, that's usually a bad term. In this particular case, it's a good term because we're trying to figure out, you know, equipment, people, supply chain. You know, that's a challenge for us. Yeah. You know, I had a different answer, but that's my answer. Uh, that right sizing, <laughs> this scale up that we're all going through right now, you know, we've just pushed all of our walls out till we can, and I've purchased all the land around me for this right sizing process, and we're running our machine shops. 24 hours a day right now to, to keep up with right now. Uh, what, what, what were you going to say? Well, I was, the OEMs coming to the party is to me so important. Uh, and then the way the state of Oklahoma uh, and the state of Colorado brought all this, united everybody to make this effort to say we need these vehicles for the OEMs to acknowledge that, you know, because one at a time I can see them saying, yeah, 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 you know, you need 50 vehicles, 100 vehicles. But everybody together, they're going, okay, uh, come on in. Um, a, lot of, a lot of great things came out of this last day and a half, and, and it was uh, fun to hear all the wonderful things that are happening. One of the, the words I kept hearing throughout today and yesterday was education. And I think even though we've had a, a tremendous amount of growth within the industry, we realize that there's still a lot of education we have to do not only you know, with, within our group or within the, the NGV industry, but also outside the industry as well. And uh, you know, that's certainly something we try to continue to do at, at, at Queen Cities is to work on education, whether it's you know, pieces about, uh, uh, collateral pieces about, about natural gas and vehicles, whether it's uh, training for first responders. Uh, one of the things we talked about, uh, Dennis Smith and I, maybe you know Dennis, the director of Clean Cities, he and I were at a, at a conference about a month or so ago, and uh, we were talking to some people who are actually upfitters in the industry, and some of the things they were telling us about was just complete BS. And we thought, man, there's, there's still this need within the industry because it has grown so much to do some education there. So we're looking at trying to put together a piece on, on again, kind of the, the myth versus the facts about natural gas. So, um, so I still think, you know, from everything we heard is, uh, or everything I heard, uh, the one word that sticks out is education. Well, so let's talk about education. I mean, uh, we heard this morning a presentation about how we've got to coordinate our message, consistency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how do we do that? I mean, uh, you know, other than everyone ponying up some money so we can do a $25 million advertising program nationally, how, does, how do you coordinate that? How do, how do you get that consistency and message among the hundreds of companies that are involved in the industry? But not all at once now. <laughs> well, you know, 
having the consistent numbers on the website. Because I go to presentations and one guy's saying they're 90% cleaner, this guy's 60% cleaner. You know, everybody's got their own kind of magic number that they want to quote that, you know, we're reducing the, the amount of carbon footprint or we're this much cleaner in gasoline. Uh, those consistent numbers that we can reach out and fact check each other on and use those consistent numbers, whether it's someone from the clean city giving us the consistent number, the coalition giving us the number, and then everybody singing the same song would help take some of the myths out when we're, when we're not saying the right thing. Mm. My education aspect is towards the safety of the cylinders. You know, a lot of things that we do is we do our due diligence on our customers, making, making sure that they're capable of installing the vessel appropriately and taking care of it. Safety of the cylinder is important. But we're, I can't tell you for sure how they educate their customer in, in all cases. And then, uh, as we've talked with Doug Horn, you know, how, how do you properly dispose of that cylinder? We've got 15 year cylinders coming out of service right now. How do you take care of those? It's supposed to come out of service. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so you're in a different situation. I mean, right. your customers are the industry, the yeah. installers, and the, uh, but your customers are the fleet operators. The fleet operators. Yes. So, how, how do we do this? Well, I, I go back to what Tom had, had said that uh, from a consist, consistent message, uh, whether it's you know, natural gas vehicles for America that's out there, whether it's ANGA or somebody at the state level or somebody like me at the field level, that message has to be consistent. And in order to, to generate that trust and that credibility with those customers. And how do you do that? I, I, I believe somebody has to be at the head of that chain that's driving that message and, and getting that consistency out. I know at Clean Cities, you know, our, our goal is to help provide these tools and resources and education. So I would say to you as an industry, you know, we, we continue to look and, and try to, you know, as industry has grown to realize that we need to uh, not only add new tools and resources, but, but again, go back and look at some of these other things that are out there. So, you know, so we're looking at trying to do some case studies. Some of, you know, again, some, some of us old crusties might recall there were some case studies Gosh, was it 10 or 12 years ago? There was a trash truck case study and a municipal bus and I think maybe a shuttle fleet. Uh, so we're looking at trying to go back and, and update those so we can get out again some more consistent information about performance of these vehicles and, and, and kind of real life testimonials that, that come from us and it's not somebody that has a dog in a fight that's trying to sell an engine or a truck. Uh, so we're, we're, we're looking at all those things, but I would say, you know, come to us because we hopefully we can be that resource I guess you know the good news bad news about government is it's government but the good news is sometimes people say well okay they're, they're unbiased because again we're not trying to sell a product or a station um, so you know so maybe you know we need to be working with with you closer and, and, and rich with your group I know we do a lot already but to try to find out okay what are those you know top three top five messages that, that are inconsistent and maybe is confusing the marketplace that, that maybe we need to put some resources on to try to address. Yeah, I mean, I, when I listened to the presentation this morning, I said, okay, I understand the why and I understand the what. I don't understand the how. Yeah. Uh, again, orchestrating something like that, unless somebody, you know, uh, when I was the American Gas Association, we had a large national advertising program and a lot of the utilities sort of piggybacked on that. Well, that's great, as long as you got a lead horse. But, uh, you know, we don't have any horse. You know? uh, and, and now, Anga has an advertising program, uh, and Chesapeake does a lot of advertising, but that's, you know, Anga's got its own, own message. Some of it is NGVs, but some of it is, is broader. Some of it is uh, power generation, and just the general natural gas is good message, like we saw uh, this morning. Uh, but there's no, there's no natural gas vehicle communication center. Um, I, I, I'd be delighted to get some recommendations from people in the audience about what they'd want us to do. Um, at, you know, at, what, what do you want Steve to do? <laughs> in the spare time. Uh, in the spare time. <laughs> yeah, George, are you, no, you had a question? No, statement, okay. Um, yeah, in the back, all the way in the back. Yeah, I should be doing that.
I don't know. I've been thinking about this the whole whole thing because we've been talking about the branding earlier this morning and how do we get the message out there and then they talked about the gas land and true land and, and YouTube video and, and how, how that's effective. Maybe if we just produced a good video with the five points and made it available to members to if like me I can get PSA time on the TV because I'm a public utility, I can get a, as long as there's safety or something in it, I can get that free air time. But somebody else might want to actually, in their neighborhood where they do the customers or whatever, pay for a little bit of time on their own. Just have it available as, as in a library where we could grab it. Something like that. I don't know. That's an idea out there to send our five points or whatever we need to, to show the public. First of all, I want to thank NGVA for doing this uh, conference because it's been very helpful. Um, I'm going to speak for Oklahoma because I don't know about the other regions because I know Oklahoma very well. I'm the Clean Cities Coordinator for Tulsa. Education and advertisement aren't the same thing, and that's what bothers me more than anything. We have so many people out there that they want to pull the trigger, they just don't know what trigger to pull. So what we truly, truly need is we need the more education. We need CV Bora going and doing compelling case studies. But we need more than just one guy doing compelling case studies. I mean, Steve does a wonderful job, but he's only one man. And it takes him quite a lot of time to get out there and go do these things. So um, we need to have those many compelling case studies. We need to involve our, our elected officials and say, hey, look, this is an option. People know that natural gas is out there and that natural gas can be used as a transportation fuel. They know enough to ask a few questions. They don't know what questions they need to be asking. So we, that's what we need to be teaching them. We need to have the public forums. We need to have that mayor come in and say, hey, we're hosting this public forum for this city in, in you know, southwest Oklahoma or in Texas or wherever. Come on down. I'm going to be there. I'm excited. I'm going to learn um, so that individuals can learn themselves and then even those companies can come. How do we pay for it? That's a great question. Um, Th thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, it's definitely a question that Clean City struggles with every day. How do we pay for it? But um, we leverage our funds and that's what we need to do in this industry is we need to show that the, the payback for this and there is payback for education in this. Mm -hmm. So that's my recommendation. Okay. Any other? Okay, um, let me go to a, a, a different topic. What's the biggest complaint you get from your customers? And again, different kinds of customers. And in your case, the biggest complaint the Clean Cities people hear from their participants about, about the NGV market. What's the biggest one? From my standpoint, Rich, <laughs> what I hear is, is the industry is somewhat fragmented. And, and what I mean by that is, I, as a fleet operator, I can't go to a one-stop shop and get my fuel needs, my vehicle needs. Uh, I have to, uh, hopefully they rely on, on some of the things that I do where I can facilitate some of that for them. But uh, I think that's the most frustrating part from a fleet manager standpoint is how do we get this done? Who do we have to talk to? And there's a number of variables there that they need to get accomplished to do that. Is there a resolution? I mean, how would you... If you, if you were the czar, how would you change that? Uh, I, I think that's something that's going to eventually evolve. I, I do believe at some point in time we will see uh, the one-stop shop. And uh, until then, uh, I kind of look at, at myself to be the facilitator for that fleet operator. That if they have those type of questions, I will go out and find uh, the industry vendors that are interested in coming to, to talk to them. Uh, and hopefully from that they can, they can uh, get the information they need and hopefully you know, get the vehicles converted or get a fueling station built. Besides your price, what is the biggest Really? Complaint? Cost is an issue? <laughs> well, let, let me get out my list here. <laughs> I was talking to Ron Eichelman earlier. Uh, no, uh, relative to cylinders and the products that we provide, probably the biggest complaints we have is, you know, you buy one tank and it costs this much, but yet they want to buy 3000 later, so they want that first tank as a, a small incremental price, okay? That's, that's um, the lead times for the industry, 
is we have some customers that they have a great crystal ball. They can tell us 100 tanks a week, every week, okay? Others say 100 tanks over the course of a month, every month. And then we have some that say, well, I need that 100 tomorrow. So there, there's a little bit of a challenge that we have with delivery times, whether it's our challenge or customers' expectations. Um, I think if we get a complaint on cylinders, it's, I just filled up my vehicle and it's only 75% filled. What's mm -hmm. going on? What's wrong with your tank? Well, what pressure did you go to? Well, I only went to 3,200 PSI. It's not the tank, Tom. Your turn. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, <laughs> what's going on that station, Tom? Yeah, and I'm going to talk about tanks just a, a second, too. Um, as a dispenser manufacturer, a lot of people don't understand how gas actually gets through the dispenser. We're weighing gas. We don't care how many cubic feet of whatever went through that dispenser. It doesn't matter. What we know is 5.66 pounds of something went through there. We think it was methane because the dispenser has no way to know. So what we get is we get the call from a guy that just bought a brand new Lincoln composite or whatever tank he bought. And on the side of it, it said 21 gallons. And, they, and then the first guy they call is they, they call me and your station's out of calibration and then we go to the trouble to prove that. The next guy they call is a guy that upfitted it. And there is a, um, a little bit of not, people not understanding what a gasoline gallon equivalent actually is. You know, because a lot of the things we worked on were pre-ethanol. You know, so the gas is different, a gasoline gallon equivalent's different, you know, back in 1992 when we did this versus what it is now. So it's another education deal. And maybe we need to relook at what a gasoline gallon equivalent is. Um, but that is a complaint that I get all the time that somebody rolls in and they say, I just bought a 21 gallon tank. You just put 17 gallons in my truck. And I got 3,600 pounds. They don't really know what temperature it is. They don't realize the scale and the temperature. So we have to educate that nonstop. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a disconnect between the certification of the cylinders and the amount of gas that they can carry is temperature compensated to 3,600 PSI. But all, not all of the stations communicate correctly to go overfill 25%, mm -hmm. which is what the cylinders allow to, to dissipate the heat and, and pressure down to 3,600 for a full fill. When a lot of people don't understand also, as you're filling a, a vehicle with natural gas, we have some hard numbers no matter what the temperature deals with. Relief valves inside the dispensers are 4,500 PSI. Those are set, we can't adjust them. They're ANSI um, you know, relief valves, or uh, ASME. So if it's 105, like it's in Tulsa all the time, you know that gas comes up and we have to shut it off or we're gonna pop the relief valve in the tank. But also what's going on at the same time is the storage vessels in the back are creeping up and they could be sitting back there with 46, 4,700 PSI. And a lot of people don't understand these hard numbers, no matter what the temperature is out at the dispenser, we have to deal with. And uh, then they'll come back and come right back inside and go, you didn't fill my truck up. And so this education of how the expansion of the gas, you know, because we're dealing with the recompression heating of the gas in the tanks, the, the JT going through the orifice, you know, the speed of the gas, you know, everything we hear now is faster, faster, faster. That's more heat, more heat, more heat. And so it's, again, we need to go back and maintain that education on how the newer stations are evolving for speed. And then someone will turn around and the same guy like Oklahoma Natural Gas or our schools, they'll slow fill their buses. And then one day a week, they might come to the fast fill. And then they're freaking out about uh, oh, I got 3,600 today and I only got this yesterday. And it's back, we have to educate the driver on what he's driving. Back to education, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Well, you know, so, so what, if I get a phone call at headquarters, you know, and, and not, unfortunately like you, we aren't able to take our names and numbers off the website, so we, so we get the phone calls. So we get a call from a fleet manager or a customer, and, and normally it's, it's like the same three or four questions. You know, they, they already kind of have done enough legwork to know about natural gas vehicles and, okay, hey, I can get an F-250, so it's, well, 
how, you know, how much does it cost? Where do I fuel it at? And do you guys have any money for me? I mean, that's kind of the three questions I say <laughs> jokingly, but that's kind of what it boils down to. But then beyond that, a lot of the questions are, again, it gets back to the education is, well, you know, who makes, you know, am I, was my state an EPA or a carb state? Uh, who makes the type of kits I need? Uh, is this station, a, you know, is this a reliable station that, that this utility or whoever says they have? So it gets into, again, and that's when we try to connect them with, with the Queen Cities coalitions. And not to put Meredith on the spot, but Meredith, I'll put you on the spot. So, but, but, <laughs> well, well, because, you know, the, these, you know, the coordinators are the boots on the ground. So, so when you hear from, from somebody, I mean, what, what are you hearing from, from your, your stakeholders and, and, and others that give you a call that want to know about NGVs? Um, you know, we get phone calls about what can be converted, uh, what's the difference between an EPA certified kit and a non-EPA certified kit. Um, we have signs on the highway that, um, I'm going to call him kind of a snake oil salesman. He puts signs up and says, you know, get your car converted for free. Um, it'll, it'll pay off. And, and he's doing highly, highly, uh, I, I don't want to say legal, but kits that are not following any state or federal regulations. Um, we get calls about stations, you know, where are the stations, and that, that's an easy, because, you know, we have the resources for that, definitely. Um, but people don't understand. They don't understand that when it's 105 degrees, you're not going to get a full fill. Um, and, and that little education goes a long way. Um, and that can be done, you know, through local media and things like that. But there are big issues, like the EPA kits and uh, cars that are available. The OEM, or the MOU that the governors have done has been fantastic, but it's also created a lot of new questions. Um, and, and how's that going to impact, and not only for, you know, our citizens out there, but for our purchasing directors, our local purchasing directors have questions about that. So um, we, we, we get all of the above. Hmm. That all, all of those questions, I guess, is, yeah. is the answer. <laughs> so back to education again. It, it really is. It's always, always education, and that's our job is to educate as many people as possible so that we don't have to go to work the next day or we'll get put out of business someday. That's my, my goal is to be put out of business someday. You know, on this education deal, we've got, the, we've got a problem in our, it's not our industry's problem, it's the get rich quick, quick crowds problem. They're throwing these systems up on eBay. And those systems are 3,000 PSI systems. And these people roll in our stations with these things and they don't realize that we can put 4,500 PSI and the tubing and all the fittings and everything that's coming with those eBay kits. And all they do is they can go to the other page and click over and buy an eBay 3,600-pound uh, receptacle. And they, everybody's feeling like this is legal to do. And we have to monitor this. We need a CNG. Like in Oklahoma, we are asking for a CNG police. Somehow, whether it's inspections or something, again with education that you can't mix these things um, at our stations as the OEM 3000 PSI tanks go out of uh, life we are changing our nozzles to um, all 3600 I should know this but I don't if someone pulls up to your station with a 3000 pound tank they shouldn't be able to fill <laughs> there's a 3000 pound a, 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 a 3000 pound valve that's different than the 3,600 pound, or not valve, but the receptacle? The receptacle, yeah, they're actually keyed. So if you have a 3,000 pound receptacle on your car, you cannot put the 36 on it. But if you roll in with the 36, you could put the 3,000 on it. So it won't allow you to overpressure. But it, what the hard part is, is stopping the guy from getting on eBay and ordering the correct nozzle after he's been turned down by the receptacle. At one of my stations, the stations outside my shop, we pre-qualify you. So someone from our company has looked at your tank and checked you out and personally trained you, and then you have a Blue Energy Fuels card to get gas. Uh, but my, I have a second station where it's the Wild West, like everybody else. And we monitor that station pretty hard, because again, if there's an event, we want to make sure that we didn't cause it. And, uh, you know, we, we're trying to do everything we can do. And if we see the eBay tanks or a lot of the yellow tanks that are not uh, FMS, uh, whatever the, uh, Three, the four, Federal four, Motor yeah, Safety yeah, thing, yeah, Three, we four. stop them and we tell them you cannot fuel here ever again. If we catch you in here, you know. I'll have you shot. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll call Steve. <laughs> I, I have a question sure. I'd like to throw um, to our two manufacturers. Um, we talked earlier today about the ability to do forecasting. I guess we talked about that yesterday in the, in the board report. 
what, just, just giving you a broad estimate, what level of cost reduction do you think you would be able to bring to the products you bring to market? And Tom, I know you have a wide variety. If you had a better sense of what you needed to buy and had that ability to forecast that better when you're buying epoxy, when you're buying carbon fiber, when you're buying valves, whatever it is you're buying, and Tom, I know that you're buying Coriolis meters and all the other things, how well could you subtract out some of the cost of your product if you had better forecasting numbers and abilities? You know, the biggest thing I see us being able to do is do better business with the forecasting. Stainless steel is not going to drop in price uh, that much. You know, we're already beating these guys up pretty hard. Micromotion's obviously not going to change the meter price. The CNG business is important to them, but in their grand scheme, it's nothing. Um, you know, so doing better business and, and managing your labor is the next best thing we can do with the volumes. And, and, and knowing, people telling us we're going to buy 11 this year, 10 this year, one this year. And, you know, we get the same thing they get. I have to give a quote for 40 and a purchase order for one comes in. And that's a, that's a different model. Um, in, in our particular case, our, our most expensive bill of material item is carbon fiber. We buy our carbon fiber basically on the entire year. So incrementally, uh, that's not a major change. What challenges us is when we build a lot of the same product, we start seeing uh, productivity improvements, okay? And so now we're starting to have some configurations where we're building 10,000 in a year. There, there's some good, good reductions in cost associated with that. Now, can I ask you a question? With the tanks, um, what are you guys comfortable with it being on how, the time with the, their date stamped, with it being in your inventory before it goes out? Or is it hit the floor, hit the door? Today it's not a problem. We build a tank today, it's out the door within two weeks. We build nothing for to sit on the shelf. Everything that we build right now is to order. And we're doing, we're going 24 seven. By the way, if anybody else has any questions, go right ahead and ask. Uh, anything else, I'm just paying attention to, okay. Um, all right, here, let's switch subjects. If you could pick one vehicle, one OEM vehicle to add to the market, what would it be? Steve, you want to answer? I, I know I said that is, uh, uh, even though it would be costly for the size of the vehicle, is a low price point, basic model sedan, the kind that hundreds of thousands, or hundreds and hundreds of municipalities buy, the cheapest they possibly can to give to their employees that have to drive around the county every day. They give it to their code inspectors, they give it to their social service workers, they give them Microphone. the cheapest light little Microphone. Little they give them the, the cheapest base car they can. It's got the, you know, practically a bench seat, it's white, uh, it's, it's their lowest cost product they possibly can, and, and they need to buy a lot of them because this is the, you know, if you're the employee that has to have a car because that's part of your job for the county, let's get you the cheapest thing we can. And of course, that's going to have a higher cost, you know, premium, um, because it's light duty. But that little car would probably be very attractive, I think, to the consumer retail market as well. The challenge is, is how do you put that same cost? You know, now we're talking about maybe an eight thousand dollar. I don't know the right number. There's a lot of people who've been playing with this. Maybe it's a seven thousand dollar incremental cost if you get a lot of them. But it's a seven thousand dollar cost on a fourteen thousand dollar base car instead of a $26,000 base car. Uh, well, give me an example of the car. Uh, well, a long time ago, this, this is back, when GM used to have the Cavalier, the Bifuel Cavalier. The Cavalier was a car that they sold tons of them to states and counties because it was the cheapest thing that was in their entire line. Um, right now, Ford, uh, Chrysler, they all pr try to provide at least one low price point car for that kind of marketplace, knowing that there's always people that need to buy that. It, the challenge we have is there's a the, the premium for CNG for that vehicle becomes a much higher percentage of the base price of the car, and that makes it that much more difficult to pay back. But I think there's a tremendous demand for it, and all sorts of utilities, all sorts of 
city fleets, municipal fleets, county fleets. Right. If you look even within the federal government, within the federal fleet, so you've got 650,000 vehicles in the federal fleet, and, and probably, you know, at least half of those, if not the vast majority, are exactly the same sedans you talk, yeah. that you, you're talking Cheapies. about. So, so if you talk to the, the folks from Honda, so they're on the GSA contract, but they're on there at, you know, 24, 25 and change, whatever, and they're competing against that $15,000 Chevy Cruze or whatever. So. Bingo. So when, a, so when a federal fleet manager, may, he may have a, a CNG station down the street from him, but hey, you know, 15 versus 25, right. and, and my budget's being slashed, and I'm under pressure to cut it even more, guess what he's buying? Right. Yeah, that's one of the problems with the government, because um, usually the person who buys the vehicle or has the responsibility for buying the vehicle doesn't have the responsibility for the operating cost. Yeah. Right. And so he said, well, I don't want to spend more of my money, but you know, if you've if you got the full cycle, like in a private, private company, if you got the full responsibility, you, you weigh one to the other. You say? Ford Focus, something like that. Ford, yeah. Yeah, I'm just looking from Lincoln, Nebraska, you can't sling a dead cat without hitting a Tahoe or a Suburban or something like that. <laughs> Big SUV. Big SUV. It, it burns the gas. And yeah, that's, that's my problem. I, I know there needs to be the little car, but the problem with the, in my eye, if I'm spending the money, if I see a Ford Focus, and if it ran 24-7, it's going to burn seven gallons. And if I put on a three-quarter ton truck, or even a half ton truck, I, I've always felt like that's a better investment by the most gasoline, you know, fuel-sipping car in that little one. And, you know, then start at your 10-mile-a-gallon trucks and up. Um, if I'm singing that song, that's what I'm going to look at. Because I, I love the Honda Civic. I had, my daughter was one. I loved that car. But if I drove it 24-7, I'd only use it seven gallons. Can't build load with those. I can't build load. I can't justify a million-dollar station over very many Hondas. Yet many people in the industry keep talking about, we've got to get that Homer fueling unit. We have to get those light-duty vehicles, the consumer vehicle. Focus on that. Uh, what do you say to that? I think that's where the conversion industry may need to step up and get competitive. Uh, even though it's going to cost seven, eight thousand dollars, when I'm looking at what I'm, we're asking the OEMs to do and invest in engineering and crashing and all these things, then I look at the fleet man that's going to buy a vehicle. He's going to need his return on his investment. You know, the Honda's sexy, the Cavalier's sexy, all these vehicles are sexy. The Cavalier was never sexy. But how fast am I going to get my dough back? And that's the vehicle that's using the most fuel. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's the arguments that, you know, other people make. That we, No, that's why we're focusing on the fleets. But again, we, we continue to get the argument, why aren't you focusing on the light-duty consumer market? That's where, that's where well, gasoline is three-quarters of the fuel used on road, uh, diesel being one quarter. Yet you tell me your strategy is to go after that one quarter, not the three quarters. That seems silly. What do you say? I, I, it's hard. That's a very, it's a hard question. I mean, I'd love to be able to get into a, a, an Acura or even have a new Toyota on CNG. Something to, you know, in that line that, uh, like my wife likes to drive. And, uh, you know, we just bought a new Ford Escape, and that would be a neat car to have on CNG. Uh, you know, th even in that range would be nice. And th there's, there's people that are going to buy that. How about that Chrysler that you saw up there, that demo? I didn't, I didn't get out there. I was busy. No, 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 in the slide. It was on the slide that uh, Chrysler is, is building one. Oh, the 300? Yeah. Yeah, I'd drive that thing. I'd like that car. Any other? Well, it's, uh, the example that Steve cited, uh, we have that situation sitting in front of us right now. In fact, the community sitting there looking for that sedan, ready to pull the trigger on the vehicle, ready to pull the trigger on a fueling, uh, some type of fueling app appliance. But we can't help them out because there's nothing there. But I have to go back to what, what Jack had said. I think uh, the SUV, the Tahoes, and the excursions and those type. I really believe that's, that's where the OEMs need to step up. And, and they're going to have to be cost competitive. I mean, look, look what's happening with the EV market right now with uh, Leaf and Volt cells. You know, it's, it's like anything else. You've you got a high incremental cost in those vehicles. You get, you know, once the early adopters have, have purchased those, 
uh, it's tough to get the, you know, the, the, the average consumer to come in and, and buy one. Um, you know, I, around the D.C. area, I just saw some ads last week in the Saturday paper now where I think there's, there's a, you can lease a Volt for 285 a month or something mm -hmm. with, with like $1,000 down. I mean, you know, so they're, they're really trying to move those things, but, but that's the issue. And that's what happens when you talk about any of these vehicles. So, okay, even, even if you're buying a big Tahoe, are, are you going to, you know, a, a decked out Tahoe is already pretty expensive. Are you going to drop another 14 or 15 grand for that, that Tahoe and then another, you know, four or five, which is kind of what a home refueling appliance costs you today? Maybe a few might, but are, are there going to be enough there that people are going to want to be in that business? Is there a business case for it? Well, you know something, on, when you think about the value in these vehicles, what we're seeing in Oklahoma is the resale on compressed natural gas vehicles is way elevated. So you, by the time you take your savings and then you look at your elevated resale, you've gotten a lot more of your return back based on if it was a gasoline vehicle. Um, so. In the, in the Tahoe and that end, in, like if you get 60 grand in that thing when you're done, we have these great credits. Uh, and then you get another five, six grand for that thing over the gasoline, you're out pretty clean. Mm -hmm. And with a, maybe a two year payback. Yeah, uh, the, the, those of you that sat through the uh, uh, marketing exchange, so I heard a presentation on payback. Uh, now, it was, a, it, was, it was a light duty payback. It was based on whatever data is available, which wasn't much. Uh, but residual value. Residual value, yeah. Yes. I mean, I mean uh, you, know, w you know, what do you do? We say natural gas vehicles have a better residual value. In Oklahoma, you're starting to see some evidence of that. Uh, and, and Questar, uh, uh, Salt Lake, he's. I mean, for a while there, every loose NGV in the country had found its way to Utah uh, because everybody wanted them, and so it had a higher residual value. Uh, until, we, in, until we have good data on that, though, it's hard to make that case to anyone. Uh, but I agree. Uh, once we get good data, all of a sudden, it's not $10,000 or $12,000 incremental price. It's, yeah, it's 12000 on the first cost, but you're going to get half of that back. So now your incremental price to get the cost of money is $6,000. Oh, it's very different. Um, but we need, we, you know, we have to work as an industry to try to get that data. Uh, but the, again, the more vehicles we get out there, the better, better that information is. Well, ONG just ran a couple of their vehicles through the auction at 100,000 miles instead of 175 for they could kind of test and see what that number, you know, what it was. They took the, the same truck, you know, they drive white trucks, vinyl mat, vinyl seat trucks. And I don't know what this number was. I know they was really impressed with what they got at the auction. And that, you know, they're quick auctions. And at our auctions, it's standing room only. Uh, when, the, when they know the gas company or the Chesapeake or, you know, all these white Chevrolet trucks that are running around. It's funny you mentioned the auctions. Uh, we're, we're doing some work with eBay. Uh, they approached us about a year and a half ago because they realized on their eBay Auto site that they were seeing that high mileage and alternative fuel and advanced technology vehicles, hybrids and such, were selling much more quickly than the gasoline counterparts. And they said, well, maybe what we need to do is have a separate portal where we have our, 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 green, our green vehicle sales. <coughs> And so we've had some meetings with those folks and, and, and really a, a smart bunch of people. I, I've lived out, in, lived, lived out in Silicon Valley and so I have, remember, you know, software developers that sit up all night in black light rooms on bean bags and write code. And that's what I thought these guys were. But these guys at eBay Autos are like, you know, former Ford, you know, uh, all, uh, marketing guys and, and zone managers. So they know the car business. So then they wanted to talk to us because they were interested in linking to a lot of the, the data and the tools we have on the AFDC website. So they, they did bring this site up in, uh, in April where they're, uh, there's now a, a dedicated site so you don't have to go on there if you're searching for something and do, do a search, you can actually go to the Green Auto site. But what they're seeing and, and, uh, is they're seeing a lot of fleets, so I didn't realize this, you probably, maybe you do already, is there are a lot of state fleets, in fact, or Oregon is one. Oregon, the state of Oregon, everything, everything they have for surplus that they sell, whether it's file cabinets or vehicles, they do it on eBay. And then they did it just for the reason that they're realizing they're seeing a better premium. So you can go on there and find Honda Civic GXs from the state of Oregon 
at, at, a, at a pretty good price. But what they're also finding, and I, I was reading some stories about this, uh, I don't have a life, I'm in, so I was reading government fleet news not too long ago. Uh, <laughs> we're empty nesters, and, and for, for a whole month now, my wife and I have run out of things to talk about, so I'm reading back <laughs> issues of government fleet news. Uh, but, but there are a lot of fleets, a lot of you know, missile fleets that, that we, you know, that are you know, kind of you know, part of the, the target market here, who, you know, as, as we all know, are, are crying the blues because they don't have budgets, and they're going, and, but maybe they want to have alternative fuels or even if gasoline vehicles, and they're going to these auctions, whether it's uh, the, the state auction or it's on eBay, and buying vehicles to put, it in their, put it into, their, uh, into their fleet, used vehicles instead of new vehicles. Now, so. could you reach out to those people and ask them to start reporting on, on the, the residual value, the difference between the residual values, and, and, and publicly reporting that? So people can see that, you know, last month here was a residual value for these NG NGVs and here's the one for hybrids. And it doesn't have to be just us. Right, right. Um, because that information can be very useful. Yep. Yeah, no, we, we sure can, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're just starting to really grow that. And so there's some, we want to do kind of some more formal things along those lines. Je almost? All right. Uh, one more question. Uh, in the s so we, no, okay. Um, you mentioned before, you didn't say bottlenecks. But I'm worried about bottlenecks. If we're going to see this hockey stick growth curve, there's going to be shortages of stuff. Which things are you most concerned about being short? That a real, a real problem that you know, sort of keeps you up at night? <laughs> I get a number of those. Well, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're already faced with that right now. Um, our facility switched over to the 24-7. Uh, actually, we've been working that since early February, bringing on new equipment, bringing on new people. Um, we're having to change our supply chain because some of the people that we've been working with was the right size for where we were, but they're not the right size for tomorrow where we're going to be twice as big. Um, the other challenge that we have and I'm sure that all the other cylinder uh, suppliers have it as well, is we have this uh, black stuff around the outside of the tank. It's called carbon fiber. And the carbon fiber, um, in, in years past when there were uh, supply issues, it would allocate to the markets. So a lot of the things that we have to do as a large procurer of carbon fiber is we have to sell our suppliers on where we're going with the market. We have projections next for, for next year that we could be anywhere from 5 to 10% of the world's supply of carbon fiber for Lincoln Composites alone. Really? So we're talking that we could be consume, a large consumer of carbon fiber. We are right now. Uh, so our biggest challenge is to ensure that we have that supply. And, and Credibility of forecasting for us to our carbon fiber suppliers is absolutely critical. I'm sure some of the some of the other cylinder manufacturers might have issues not only with carbon fiber, but but some of their metal uh, tubes or whatever that they start out with, that they have to have credibility in their forecasting on that sort of thing as well. Uh, so being close within hand grenade distance of what your <laughs> forecast is is pretty important. And, and guessing where we are, where we're going, like I said, it's, you know, we have some customers that say, say they'll double their requirements for next year. We, there's more competition coming on. So how does that affect things? So right sizing is, is very important for us in, in getting to the size so that the cylinders are not the bottleneck. I know we're trying to do what we can do, but there's also competi uh, competitors out there that are going through the same exercise. Huh? Um, in, in my deal, uh, the labor, the trained labor force, and we're working with all of our, um, uh, we have a group called Tulsa Tech, uh, that's the Votech system. And we're reaching out to them, telling them, this is what I need. I need this kind of guy. And um, that's the trouble I'm having. I, there's, there's guys that come in and they want to fill out an application in my shop all the time. Um, I have a different kind of guy. I can't have people watching you nonstop that you're setting ferals right, that you're doing it right. And uh, so it's a little bit higher trained guy. We, we get guys out of um, 
Spartan School of Aeronautics and those guys as well, because we, we have to have a little bit of an uppercut mechanic uh, in our side. And the labor is what I'm more afraid of, not my supply chain. I can, I, I'm pretty sure I'm able to squeeze everybody to come up to my level. Mm -hmm. And we're growing, I mean, we're, we're growing, and the labor is scary. Now, it used to be natural gas was a concern for you, but not, not anymore. <laughs> well, not the supply, but uh, I do wonder about the pricing sometimes of what will happen in the nah, future. No, don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. No, it's going to stay cheap. Write that down. What about, yeah. what about distribution pressures? Is, is that a concern that you're going to get uh, a, a, a bottleneck there? Not for, for our system, I think, Steve. I, I think we're sitting pretty good from a capacity standpoint as well as uh, the pressures that we need to supply the industry. Anybody else have any final questions? Because we're running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. It's predominantly a Japanese product. Uh, the three ma uh, major suppliers of carbon fiber, their headquarters are in Japan. They have. Uh, they do have manufacturing facilities in the United States. Jack, I was curious, what, what is the lead time right now? So when you have to order carbon fiber, how far out, you know, what, what, what are you looking at for deliveries when you place an order today? Um, for us, it's a little bit different. I mean, we, we've, we've already um, identified what we'd have for the year. Okay. And they bring it in. They bring it in today, and it's gone tomorrow. So they're bringing in truckloads every other day. Okay. okay. So, but we, we, I mean, like I have uh, communications with some of our key customers that we're delivering thousands of cylinders. We have um, very routine discussions with our carbon fiber suppliers just to make sure that they know our production rates. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have a supplier day later on this month to bring in everybody uh, to kick identify where we're going for the next year because it's it's a it, it's a big jump I'm sure, yeah. and you're not going to do that without the help of the guys behind you mm -hmm. what would you rather have um, demand you can't fill or inventory you can't sell <laughs> demand I can't fill I guess okay yeah, yeah. and I, I got a feeling that's gonna I, I think we're gonna be running into constraints like that where lead times get stretched out for stations, for uh, uh, different components in the system that will slow down the growth more than it, it necessarily had to be. But we'll still grow, but we, I think we're gonna see that, especially if we start talking about, you know, 100 times, 117 times more gas used in the, you know, the next. The, the challenge we're gonna have is is keeping the, the, the uh, stations coming online and the new vehicles coming online at the same pace. Because if you get more stations out there and, and no vehicles are coming in, we've got a challenge. Mm -hmm. And if you've got all these vehicles going out and you, they're sitting there for an hour to, to fill because there's three guys in front of them, that's going to be a, a challenge too. So, All right. Uh, I Thank you very much. I, I, it was a very enlightening panel. It's, it, we, we, again, we do this each time at the end of the end of the conference, and it's it's always it's always uh, fascinating the kind of issues you get involved in. So thank you very much. Thanks,